Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 34 where we'll address the question, how did gymnosperms diversify during the early Mesozoic to become a modern dominant plant group? Gymnosperms, the naked seed plants, are characterized by having female gametophytes with the mega gametophyte generation retained on the plant where it produces an archegodium with an egg cell from a functional megaspore. Now, gymnosperms no longer need water for fertilization, which makes them different than ferns. Male gametophytes, or pollen, develop from microspores, which are wind-blown and fall onto the female's microfill. This is a narrow opening here um, into the ovia. Now, after pollination, the pollen actually kind of grows down on a pollen tube. And there's actually two sperm cells that are going to be delivered to the mega gametophyte. Now, there's no anthereid in the male gametophyte with these gymnosperms. The life cycle of gymnosperms thus involves the development and dispersal of both pollen and, for fertilization, and seeds rather than just using spore distribution as ferns and horsetails did. Now the conifers are also spend a considerable amount of time developing seeds after fertilization, which can take up a, to a year to fully develop. Now some gymnosperms even take longer to grow seeds. The life cycle of gymnosperms thus involves the development and dispersal of both pollen for fertilization and seeds rather than using only spore distribution, as in ferns and horsetails. The conifers often spend a considerable time developing seeds after fertilization, which can take up to a year to fully develop. Some gymnosperms even take longer to grow their seeds. Most gymnosperms use wind as the major mechanism for pollination, although sometimes insects are used. Conifers in the summer make billions of pollen grains which coat the forest and beyond in these thick layers of pollen and that helps ensure pollination of female ovules. In the previous lecture we talked about the fossil record of cycads. In this lecture we're going to focus on two groups of gymnosperms that were diverse in the Mesozoic. The conifida, the conifers, and a less diverse but not less less exceptional, the Netophytes. Now, in lecture 35, we're going to then go on to the fourth group of gymnosperms, the Ginkophyta, which includes living ginkgos. The conifer phyta is a diverse group of trees and shrubs living today with about 630 species. Some of these spectacular species include the, the largest trees on Earth, the giant redwoods, the Sequoia sempervirens, and the longest living species, bristlecone pines, Pineus longivia, both native to North America. Now, one characteristic that defines the conifer phyta is the presence of needles. Now, pine needles are found in the genus Pinus are rather narrow, they're really hard leaves, and they're not seasonally lost like other trees. The narrow leaves are very stiff, and this is because as, as being narrow, they allow snow to pass through them. And this prevents the snow from weighting down on top of the branches and breaking off the branches in the winter. Conifers from tropical or warm climates don't have as stiff nor as narrow pine needles as the conifers from colder regions. Some of the ones from the tropical regions, some of these conifer phyta, are, uh, are remarkably broad in shape. And we'll take a look at some of these. The needles of conifers first grow as a single needle from a seedling or as a burst of or whorl around the growing stem or branch. In mature trees, the conifers produce needles in bunches. In pine trees, these clusters of needles are called fascicles. The needles in pine trees are further stiffened to include the woolly xylem and phylum, which are surrounded by a group of photosynthesizing cells and a thick cuticle of epidermis. This makes the needles very stiff. Conifers have a great fossil record with an origin in the Paleozoic, but they become the dominant plant during the first three-fourths of the Mesozoic, with a great fossil record from the Triassic and Jurassic periods. 
Even today they are common and there are many fossils from the Cretaceous and Cenozoic as well. This is a Jurassic fossil, Agnathus juricatus, which now goes by the name Willemia nobilis. It's a broadleaf conifer that shows the primitive nature of the early needles arranged in similar fashion as today's conifers. Now, Woolly Anemia nibis is named after David Noble, who was working as a field officer in the William National Park in the Blue Mountains of Australia. And one day in September 10th, 1994, he was stumbling around and he discovered this weird primitive looking forest of trees. The needles were broad and they were unlike any conifer he had ever seen before. He took a branch back from the field site and compared it with fossils of Angithius juraticus and was amazed that he had found a fossil that was thought to have been extinct for over 150 million years living in the Blue Mountains of Australia. So this is like finding a living dinosaur, a living dinosaur tree that was thought to be extinct for 150 million years. Pretty cool. Another tale of a living fossil is the remarkable Metasequoia. Now Metasequoia here in North America is a particularly common fossil from the late Mesozoic throughout the Cenozoic. Its needles are smaller than Willemia, um, but still broader than the typical pine tree that you find. It too is living today. It was discovered in the forests of China during World War II. Metasequoia glyptostrombolus is the dawn redwood. Today, it's a relic of its once common distribution across all of the northern continents during the Eocene and extending back in time to the Jurassic, another living dinosaur air conifer tree. Now since its discovery, botanists have transported a number of trees to North America where a group of red on wood enthusiasts have been growing them in the northwestern forests of North America. And some gardeners have grown them in urban gardens. So maybe someday Metasequoia will reclaim their once ancient range. During the Eocene, when the climate was much warmer, Metasequoia was the dominant tree in the high Arctic. Fossilized stumps are scattered in today's high Arctic tundra, which is a vivid reminder of how much warmer the past was during the early Cenozoic, where Metasequoia forests span the high northern Arctic. One of the places closer to Utah to see fossil conifer stumps is the late Eocene petrified forest at fluorescent fossil beds near Woodland Park, Colorado. Preserved within the boundaries of the National Monument are these giant stumps that are of equal size to the giant redwoods living in California. The site is also home to thousands of beautifully preserved leaf impressions and fossil insects, as well as a number of Eocene mammals. The site was once a high elevation lake, which has been preserved in the high altitudes of the southern Rocky Mountains. The conifers known from fluorescent fossil beds include the fossil trunks, which are often placed in the fossil Sequoia oxalin, or even Sequoia aphilius, uh, close to modern redwood trees living in California, as well as false cypress, Torelia, known today from more warmer climates, indicating that during the late Eocene, the Rocky Mountains were covered in a, in a dense, thick, huge forest. Petrified wood is fairly common in many Mesozoic formations. In the late Cretaceous Hell Creek Formation in Montana, fossil wood of Metasequoia is common. Now, fossil conifers are not all confined to the Mesozoic. Uh, they have a fossil record extending all the way back into the late Paleozoic. And one fossil that's found in the Permian is Wachia. Conifers appear to originate from a group of tree-like plants called the Coratales during the Pennsylvanian, uh, which shows some trends toward multi-seed cones rather than the single seeds that we saw with cycads. Wachia extends all the way back into the Pennsylvanian with fossils along the coast of eastern Canada. Wachia belongs to a group of fossil conifers called volitsiales, which appear near the root of all modern conifers but the genus extends into the Jurassic, so it's a survivor of the Permian-Triassic extinction. Another common Mesozoic fossil conifer are members of the Archaeria, a group that includes the living monkey puzzle tree. Today, the group is limited to South America and New Zealand, but their fossils are common during the late Cretaceous of North America and Europe, where they go by a number of different names. 
These trees are often used as a backdrop to dinosaur documentaries. Another common group of fossil conifers include pines, the sequoia, the redwoods, the Camryophytes, the white cedar. These are all from the Eocene Green River Formation of Utah and Colorado. Here in Utah we also have fossils of the late Cretaceous Peritaxium, which is thought to be related to Metasequoia and modern redwoods. And the genus Taxium, which is this bald cypress that's native to southeastern United States. The leaf genus is also found in the high Arctic during the warm period of the Cretaceous. Other cypress trees are known from the fossil record and are particularly abundant during the Cretaceous. Here is uh, fossils of elate tiles, which is, might be more closely related to the modern uh, cy cypress, the China fir tree, Cunninghamia, which is the most primitive living cypress that we know of. Now, one of the challenges of recognizing fossil conifers is that these primitive forms resemble both cycads and ferns, as well as some angiosperm plants that we'll see later. The genus Podziazampius was long regarded as a fossil cycad, but it's now regarded as a fossil conifer. Often it's the fossilized cones that allow for the recognition of fossils as members of the conifer phyta, and often they are not preserved or not really associated with the fossil leaves, which are much more common. Here are a few more fossil conifers from Utah. This is Brachiophytum and Pagiophytum, known from the Jurassic. They are members of the monkey puzzle tree family, Arcaracea. The Triassic Chinle Formation here in Utah has a few fossil conifers, including the primitive genus Dinophyton. The next group of gymnosperms that we'll examine are the strange and bizarre Natophyta, which today are represented by three genera, Natophym, Wilwichia, and Ephedra. Now let's take a look at each of these unique gymnosperms. Netium is a broadleaf gymnosperm that's found in tropical jungles and forests of the northern South America, the Congo Basin, Southeast Asia. They live in wet climates, which never freeze, and the plant is an evergreen tree, so it never loses its leaves. Now the plant produces pollen in small cones rather than flowers, although pollination can be facilitated by some insects which have been implicated in pollination. Nadium does not have much of a fossil record, as their leaves resemble other plants and the leaves are not seasonally shed, making them less likely to be preserved in the fossil record. There are some traits in the leaves, such as the opposite and desiccate phyllotaxa. This means that there are alternating leaves within these broad leaf structures. And this is kind of a unique feature. And if a fossil branch is preserved without these leaves, they might be recognized in the fossil record. Now, ephedra is a microfill plant lacking leaves and grows in the deserts of eastern Utah and throughout the American Southwest. In fact, I have some growing in my yard right now. The plant has a little male and little female cones, which is pollinated through wind dispersal. Pollen of ephedra can be found as far east as Maine and New York, and the plant is used by locals to make a stringent tea that contains ephedra, which is a stimulant. It's called Mormon tea here in Utah, although it was commonly used by Native Americans as tea before the arrival of Europeans. Pseudephedrin, that you take as a common cold medicine for a decongestion, is an isomer of ephedrin. Now, ephedra also grows in, the, in southern Europe and Asia. Now, because ephedra lacks leaves, it doesn't have a very common fossil record. It does, however, have an excellent pollen record, which extends back into the Mesozoic. The most unusual new to fight it is the bizarre plant, well, Wichia which grows in the Nubian deserts of South Africa. It has distinct male and female plants with cones that resemble what we saw in cycads. Yet the leaves are, these, are very large and broad. Well, Wichia grows in the dry deserts and low, it's a low-lying plant with these thick cuticle-covered leaves. This is the plant that inspired the little shop of horrors. Now, males produce pollen-filled cones, which pollinate the female, the purple female cones, which are spiral open to catch the male's pollen. They are magnificently bizarre plants and are really unique. 
One of the amazing things is that Welwichia has a fossil record that extends all the way back into the Mesozoic. Um, these broad leaves and distinct cones are found in the Jurassic and may even extend back into the Triassic. What makes Welwichia interesting to paleobotanists is its placement in the discussion of the origin of angiosperms, which we'll visit this fossil a little bit later. So remember this monstrous prehistoric plant. Thanks for watching an exciting video on fossil gymnosperms. Next time we'll look at the fossil record of the fourth gymnosperm group, the ginkgos. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to take a geology course at Utah State University, check out our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about myself, check out my webpage at benjaminslashburger.org. Thanks for watching.